السلام عليكم ورحمة الله كيف مناسن؟ That's it. That's the end of it. I don't know anymore. <laughs> so don't expect anymore. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. ووصى بها إبراهيم بنيه ويعقوب يا بني إن الله اصطفى لكم الدين. فلا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ثم أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى in today's brief conversation first of all I'd like to thank the community for inviting me here and it's a pleasure to be here may Allah Azza bless this community and bless this much and keep it full for all the prayers especially Fajr and Isha and may Allah Azza fill it with young blood in the morning and evenings Amin Ya Rab. Okay. Uh, uh, what I wanted to do in this talk with you uh, today uh, is make reference to some ayat that I've talked about before and I've given durus on them before but I'll try to come at them from a different point of view this time. Also what I wanted to do is uh, start from kind of an outside the Quran uh, kind of disclaimer. And that is that the concern we have for our children is something built into our deen. It's something that's, it's not something that we just came up with now. The concern, the worry about the future generation is something that was given to us by our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And actually even before him, the first time we learn about a concerned father is Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam is worried about his, you know, uh, his son. And he even begs Allah azza wa in case of his son. So the concern a father has for his child in regards to deen is something that's built into this deen. It's a very fundamental part of this religion. And Allah Azza wa teaches us something by telling us many many times about prophets who had problems with their children. Many times. I mean Ibrahim alayhi salam is blessed with wonderful children. He's got Ismail, he's got Ishaq. He's got wonderful children. Nuh alayhi salam, not so much. Ya'qub alayhi salam, Couple of great kids, couple of problem kids, majority problem kids, right? So you've got even prophets that had trouble with their children. And that's important to note because if even prophets had trouble with their children, there's no guarantee that you and I, no matter how much we try, we can't avoid trouble with children. That's from the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah will bless some of us with easy children, or some of our children will be easy and some of our children will be a test. And we have to work with all of them. And that's just part of this deen. And that's just part of life. No two kids are going to be the same. There's not one formula to deal with all of your children. Like for instance, in the case of Yaqub alayhi salam, we don't believe that he treated Yusuf alayhi salam better and he treated the other kids worse. And that's why they got that way. He's a prophet. Obviously, one of the first things prophets do is live by justice. And that's not justice, that you are good to one child and you're not good to another child. We don't expect that from Yaqub alayhi salam. So he did his best as a father, but he still had trouble with his children. Alhamdulillah, in the end, even they made tawbah. And that's a gift Allah gave him. But Allah also, talk, like I said, talked about Nuh alayhi salam, whose son until the end did not make tawbah. Also, just because they, they are prophets, you would think, you know how when you have a good job, it comes with benefits. Like some of you have a good job and you get health insurance for your whole family. Right? So you profit pretty good job. It's the employer is Allah Azza wa Jal. Maybe it should come with some benefits. My family should be guaranteed. Not even the prophets get a guarantee of their family. Not even the wife. Not even the child. And even in the case of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the most incredible ahadith you find is when he's talking to his child. He's talking to the mother of the believers. He's talking to Fatima radiallahu anha. Fatima to Zahra. He's talking to her. And he says, Ya Fatima tu bintu Muhammad, ittaqillah, fa inni la amliku laki min Allahi shay'an. Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, watch out for Allah, be careful about Allah. I will not be able to help you, I will have no authority even in your case in front of Allah. He's telling this to his own daughter sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, he's teaching us something very important. Just because we are Muslim, and just because we are doing our best, 
We cannot doubt that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, does anything short of the best. He is the role model for all fathers in the future. Especially fathers of daughters. Those of us that are sitting in this audience and we have daughters, we, have, we are obliged, we are honored to be the continuation of the Prophet Sunnah. Because he was also the, the father of daughters that were, were raised. He had sons also but they died at an early age. But he, he, Allah gave him the gift of daughters, multiple daughters that he had the, uh, you know, the pleasure of raising all this time. So this is something that we should take honor in. That's why the, uh, you know, our view of having a, do a daughter is changed. Before Islam, in India for example, the culture of having daughters, before Islam, the culture even in Arabia of having daughters, when you had a daughter, it was like you made a face, like, huh? oh man, how am I going to face the community now? You know, even to this day in the Muslim world, even in some of your families, you're at the hospital with your wife, she almost died giving birth, and then the child came out and immediately your mother sends you a text message, the husbands, is it good news? <laughs> Is it good news means? Is it a boy? And then you don't respond and she goes, okay next time inshallah. Right? As though a girl is a bad news, subhanAllah. How far we've come. And Allah actually complains in the Quran about people who don't honor their daughters. That when the daughter is born, walla wajhuhu muswaddan, his face turns dark. Like a cloud is hanging over his face, he's depressed, I just had a daughter. SubhanAllah. So before we talk about worrying about our kids, we have to worry about what are we like as parents. We have to deal with that first. And that's a pretty big problem to deal with. But that's not even the disclaimer I want to start with. The disclaimer I want to start with is, that I, that I was saying before is, concern for our children is built into our religion. It's a very fundamental aspect of our deen. And it's something that generation after generation after generation of Muslims were very good at. Alhamdulillah, we're very very good at raising children for generation after generation after generation. Obviously the world has changed since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But some things, the success the Muslims have had in raising their children relatively has been great. Until now. Something has changed in the world so drastically that it's affected not just how governments are run, it hasn't just affected how the economy works, it hasn't just worked, affected how you know, nations deal with each other. It hasn't just affected industry. It's also affected what happens inside the house. Not just the Muslim house, every house. The world has changed dramatically. What the family looks like now, it never looked like in human history. It never looked like that in human history. How children are raised now, it never looked like this in human history in any culture. Not just Muslim culture, in any culture. Globalization and the advancement of mass communication and then on top of that the invasion of you know, ex the extreme form of consumerism. I don't even say capitalism, I say consumerism. That we've become just addicted you know, customers of products. That mentality has invaded, it's made itself even inside our home. I'll give you a small example of what I'm talking about. Your children, now many of you are parents here, your children. What do they ask you for the most? What do they ask you for all the time? Candy. Candy? The, mashallah, you're, you have some really righteous kids, they only ask you for candy? Nintendo. Okay, Nintendo, you gotta keep up a little. iPod, PlayStation. Three, car, really? They got older? Car, toys. Most of the time, where did they get news about the iPad? Did they see it in a dream? Like Yusuf salam saw a dream, 11 stars, sun in the moon, so they saw a dream, there's an Apple product. You know, Ya Abati inni ra'itu tufahan ala hatifin. Like, Dad, I saw an Apple on a phone. You know, what does that dream mean? No, no, no. Where did they see the iPhone? Either their friends have it, or they saw it on TV. They saw other friends have it. Then they say, I want to get that, those, those sneakers. I want to get a shirt, I want to get that shirt, I want to get that toy. Where did they get that toy's idea from? Where did the ilham come from? It came from media. We, we, are, we expose our children to media, and in that media they're told to basically beg us to get them those toys, and we get them those toys. And by the way, they're not just the only victims of that, we are victims of that too. The brands we wear, actually you feel, you feel uh, really like high class when you wear an expensive watch out of all of a sudden 
you feel like you're all of a sudden you're more worth of a human being. Before that, you were, you know, the moment you walk out of the Apple store with an iPhone in your hand, all of a sudden you just start looking more handsome. <laughs> Something happened. I don't know how I got cooler like this, but it, it just happened. It has nothing, but we, we actually assume that we are, our worth as human being, beings is related to these products. And if you're not wearing brand name clothes, and you don't have that kind of a phone, or you don't have this toy or that toy, that you're worth less. Somehow you're not equal to others. Others are better than you. Just because the things they have in their hand are better than the things you have in your hand. Right? So we've, even Muslims, we've become pretty much zombie consumers. That's what we've become also. When we talk about raising our children in this society, we have to first understand what's happening with the world. What's happening with all of us and with the world. Before we can think about raising our children effectively. That's, so that's one big problem. The second big problem is what does success mean? Well, this one is what is your worth? What are you worth? Nowadays our children are being raised to think all they are worth is these products. The brand of clothes, the kind of house, the kind of car your parents drive, drop you off to school at, the, the brand of the book bag you're wearing, you know, th that sort of thing. That's all you're worth. And then on top of that, the additional problem is, what does it mean to be successful? Our idea of success even 20, 30, 40 years ago was, for the Muslim, vast majority of the Muslim world, maybe some of you did not have a good opportunity for education, or your parents did not have a good opportunity for education, and they put all of their effort in getting you a good education. And you've learned that lesson in your life. So you say, my children better have top-notch education. If that means they have to go to a private school, if that means that we have to rent a house, rent an apartment and live uncomfortably so they can get a good education, we will do it. If that means we have to take an insane amount of money for loans, to put them in an Ivy League school, and to put them into an expensive med school, or to put them into an elite program, we will do it. Why? Because the most important part of your success is what? Your education. And the children here, they're told by their parents this over and over and over and over again. You have to have an education. You will, be, you will be a failure in life if you don't get a good education. You have to finish college, then you have to finish this, and you have to finish that. And if you're, if you're from the Indo-Pak subcontinent, obviously if you're not a physician, then you have failed. And you should not expect anything from this dunya. Now the only thing left for you is akhirah. Because, you know, and your parents will never be happy with you now because you are not a surgeon or you're not, you know, even don't be a dentist. Dentists are humiliating. Just don't even bother with that, right? So that's what we've done. Our, uh, our idea, and by the way, why is it that being a physician is so important in, the, in a certain segment of our community? Do you know why? Because it pays the most. It's not because you get to save lives or because you're serving humanity. That has nothing to do with it. If, if doctors were paid the same salary as bus drivers, our Desi community would not be crazy about making their children doctors. There's no hirs, there's no, there's no zeal to get our children to become, you know, saviors for the world. No parents are so happy when their son becomes a doctor. Then he says, I'm going to Doctors Without Borders for three years. I'm going to go serve Doctors Without Borders in flood-ridden areas for three years. I'm going to go to, to Somalia, then I'm going to go to Pakistan, I'm going to go to Bangladesh, then I'm going to go to Malaysia, and I'm going to serve no salary, non-for-profit work. These parents are going to say, Ya Allah, we put all this money in to make you a doctor. And this is what you do? You should have been part of the same blood-sucking machine that the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies are a part of. That's what we wanted you to do. Why did you go and do... Why are you saving lives? What's wrong with you? You know? That's what we've become. And then we say something's wrong with our children. <laughs> you know? We have to... Honestly, we have to look in the mirror. What are, we, what are we creating? Something has fundamentally changed. Our idea of success has become money. Our idea of education has become a career that makes a lot of money. Everything comes back to money. If you're successful, it means you have a lot of money. If you're successful, it means you have an education. Education in what field? A field that will give you a good career, which means you will have good money. That's, that's what success is now. Everything comes back to this. That's it. Now this is different from old times. This is different from old times. In old times, to have an education means to understand yourself, 
to understand the world around you and to contribute to making the world a better place. And to make the world a better place, sometimes you have to study history. Sometimes you have to study sociology. Sometimes you have to study political science. Sometimes you have to study media. Sometimes you have to study journalism. You have to study a variety of fields to contribute to society. Not one field. Not one field. And by the way, the most successful, in, and by any measure, the most successful communities in the United States are the ones that did not limit their children to one field. My friends often tell me, one of my friends tells me, if, if Steven Spielberg was in a Pakistani household, he would have been a doctor. <laughs> right? He would have been a doctor. Why? Because we don't... What do you mean you go to film school? What's wrong with you? Did you? Are you failing medicine? You know? You're going to give your parents high blood pressure. Now let's talk a little bit about raising our children. First of all, our mentality has to change. We, if they don't see in us the right definition of success, if they don't see that in our personality, our conversations, we cannot expect them to have the right definition of success for their life. They have to see that coming from us in what we talk about all the time, in what is important to us most of the time. When husband and wife are talking to each other, are children listening or no? Always. Always. Their ears are always on. Now if you two are talking about the bills, and you're talking about paying off the house, or you're only talking about movies, or you're only talking bad about this other family and what they did, or whatever you're talking about, they will come to know these are the things that adults, this is what my parents do. This is what's, what's important in life. Right? That's, that's it. If you and your wife are talking about Qur'an, you're talking about Akhirah, you're talking about doing good to others, you're talking about helping somebody, and they see that from you. They just, you don't have to give them a talk about it, they just see it. The most effective parenting is not even telling your parent to, child to do anything, they just see it. They just see it all the time inside the home. A lot of you think if, if I just bring my child to a brother Noman lecture and sit him down inshallah after that they will be righteous after that. Just a couple of YouTube videos and their problems will be solved. Ain't gonna help and you probably already discovered that. You, you are the real counselors to your children. I'm the real counselor to my child. We have to become their best friends. And that's the next thing that's changed in the world. You know, parents and children had a very organic, natural relationship in the old world. In the new world, dad is at work most of the day. And he comes home tired. By the time he comes home, most of the time children are already asleep. And by the time he goes to work, he probably, a lot of times dad leaves to work before kids even wake up. And if he doesn't leave home before kids wake up, he sees them for maybe five minutes while they're having breakfast, and he goes and they go. So basically for five out of seven days in a week, Parents and ch father and children have no conversation with each other. If any conversation, did you do your homework? Okay, now get me some water. That's it. That's the conversation. Now comes the weekend. But at the weekend, you have a, a dawat over here and a party over there, and you gotta sleep until 12 o'clock, and you gotta, you got things to do around the house, etc. You don't spend that time with your kids either. You don't really talk to them. You don't really communicate with them. This is the real problem. We have to make time for our children during the week and weekends. That's the practical advice I'm giving you. For, and myself. We have to make time for our children to talk, just to talk to them. Just to listen to them and to talk to them, even if they're talking nonsense. We should be a part of their life, a big part of their life. Not, you know, for a lot of you, the only role you have to your children you're like the wall in the house. It's always there, but you don't talk to it. It's always, you, you need it. It's there, we know it's important, it's paying the bills. Other than that, I have no relationship with it. You know what happens to parents like that? You will find the consequences of that the moment they become teenagers. Once they hit 14, 15, and they become a little dependent, and then they ask you for a car, and you say, no, why do you want a car? Fine, I'll just go with my friends. I'll get a job, I'll save some money and buy myself a car. And then all of a sudden you hear the news, Dad, I'm moving out. Moving out? Where are you going? Doesn't matter. I'm an adult now. And now you come running to the masjid. Imam Sahib, give me a surah. Give me a dua, I can fix this boy. 
It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. That you, you can't have state of emergency when they're 17, 18, 19, 20. It's got to be built way, way before. Way before. Now, I'll come to some practical bits of advice. For the pa parents who have children under 10 years old, show of hands please, children under 10 years of age. Okay, quite a few of you, alhamdulillah, myself included. My eldest is 10. So for us, our biggest job is to us to teach our children Islam us teaching our children Islam did the prophets alayhim salatu wasalam when the prophets were teaching deen they were teaching everybody deen they were but when Allah Azza wa Jal talks about children learning Islam in the Quran it's very few times Allah talks about children learning children receiving advice but whenever he talks about it it's from the parents when, listen to that again. Whenever Allah talks about children getting guidance in the Quran, it's always from parents. And within the parents, it's always from the father. Because the mother is always there. The mother, you don't, the mother doesn't have to do extra work to be there for the child all the time, and to care for him all the time, and to give him advice all the time. You don't have to give moms training on how to be a mom, it comes naturally. Allah put that inside them. Fathers, however, are horrible. We have to go through training to become real fathers. It doesn't come naturally to us. Just because you had a baby, when a mother has a baby, her feelings, her emotions, everything changes immediately. Changes. A father is like, you know, three, four days go by, a friend, friend say, hey, I heard you had a baby. Yeah, man, it hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> Somebody needs to hit you, <laughs> so it hits you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It hasn't hit me yet. Because the feelings of fatherhood, they're not, they're not natural to us, we have to build them, we have to work on them, right? So Allah mentions Luqman, عنه, making the time, finding the right, right opportunity, and then talking to his son. We find Yaqub السلام, talking to his sons, Ya baniya inna Allah astafa lakum uddeen. We find Ibrahim السلام, saying this to his sons, same exact advice Yaqub السلام, gave to his sons. That's pretty amazing because that told you that father did a job to his child, not just on how to be, be raised himself, but how to be a father. We're going to teach our children how to be good fathers one day. Because Ibrahim taught Ishaq and Ishaq taught Yaqub. And what does Quran say? Ibrahim and Yaqub, meaning grandfather and grandson said the same exact thing. Did they say it at the same time? No. They said it two generations apart from each other. Ibrahim was talking alayhi salam to Ismail and Ishaq. Yaqub alayhi salam was talking to his 11 sons. He was talking to his 11 sons. But they said exactly the same thing. وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ يَا بَنِيَّا إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينَ فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَانْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ That's incredible. That Allah says the grandfather and the grandson gave the exact same advice. Why? Because the tarbiyah was passed down. Not just on how to be a good son, but one day how to be a good father. How to be a good father. That's the kind of tarbiyah. In other words, we're going to be giving tarbiyah to our children even when they become fathers. Even when they get older, we're going to give them advice about raising children. And they're going to see that from us. And if we do our job right, we're going to look back. You know, a lot of parents, they were abusive. A lot of parents were abusive. And they yelled at their children and they insulted them and they put them down and all these kinds of things. And so when they have children, they say, I'm going to be different from my father. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to love my child. I'm going to be this way, that way, or the other way. We end up being exactly like our fathers, whether we like it or not, by the way, in one way or another way. But here what we're learning is the, the power of generation after generation if you do your job right with your children. If you do your job right. And by the way, an, another important question. Is Ibrahim, are Ibrahim's children the same quality as Yaqub's children? <laughs> are Ibrahim's children, who are Ibrahim's children? Ismail Ishaq. Who are Yaqub's children? Yusuf bin Yamin and the rest of the brothers. Same quality or no? No, but the advice is the same, right? The advice is exactly the same. How come? What Allah is telling us, teaching us here is, it doesn't matter if you have easy kids or difficult kids, you have to do your job. There are some parts of parenting that don't change at all. Other things have to change. 
other things happen. But this part of parenting will not change at all. You have to give your te children the teaching of deen. It will come from you. It will not come from a qari sahab. It will not come from the imam or the khatib. It will come from you. And so I come now, to, to as, the, as my talk winds down, I want to share with you some very practical, immediate things that all of us can do, myself also. I personally believe that Islamic education needs to experience a revolution. That's my personal belief, that Islamic education needs to experience a revolution. What do I mean by that? There is Islamic studies for the alim. The alim will study fiqh, hadith, tafsir, aqidah, he'll study all of these things and he'll become a alim. And he will study them at the very high level. But there's a level underneath that we need to create actually, it doesn't really exist too much yet. And we need to create it, a level of learning Islam just for daily practice, daily life. Now, I'm not talking about fiqh, I'm talking about advice for fathers. I'm talking about advice for wives. Just a curriculum. How to be a good Muslim wife. How to be a good Muslim husband. How to be a good Muslim father. How to be a good son. How to be a good daughter. What advice does Allah have? Entire curricula just based on making us good human beings. This is education. Real education is not that you know how to do C++ and you're Microsoft something something certified and you're Cisco certified and on top of that you have an accounting degree and you got an MBA. All of that means you can make money. That does not mean you're educated. That just means you can make money. That's it. That's all that means. That does not make you a better human being. I know plenty of physicians that are terrible human beings. I know plenty of programmers that are horrible human beings. They're very jahid, they're uneducated in how to be a husband. They're uneducated in how to be a father. What good is their education? All that is is skilled labor. You're just a better worker at the factory. That's all it is now. It's a virtual factory, but that's all you are. We have to revolutionize Islamic education in that we have to create these you know, uh, 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 Islamic education revolving around becoming better human beings. Adab. Specific areas that need help now that never needed help before. I told you what's happening inside the home is being targeted. Most Muslim fathers don't even know what it means to be a Muslim father anymore. These things came naturally to us. They were not difficult for us in the past. But now, because of the change of the world and the change of our lifestyles, these things are, we have to re-educate ourselves in these things. We have to come back and do them all over again. How to raise ch kids specifically. There's one uh, set of CDs. I think you might be able to find MP3s online also. I want everybody here to listen to them. They're not by me. They're by a person I really, really admire. Brother Hisham Al-Awadi. Brother Hisham Al-Awadi. Children Around the Messenger. That's one series. It's called what again? Children Around the Messenger. And Mother of the Believers. Mothers of the Believers. These two series, I want every person, especially every father here, especially every father, but the entire family to listen to both of these series. It's really, really important that you do. They benefited me tremendously and they can benefit, you know, parents in general, just these are few resources we have, but they're gold. They're really, really valuable. We should take advantage of them. And we should inshallah ta'ala try to uh, uh, have our entire family listen to them. Put them in your iPod, put them in the car, listen to it every day, you will benefit tremendously. Recite Qur'an with your children. Don't hire a Qadi to recite Qur'an. Recite Qur'an with your children. Mawlana Sahib comes, reads Qur'an and goes home. What about you? What about you? You don't have time? If you don't have time for Qur'an, why does your child have to have time for Qur'an? Sit down with your child, make those 20 minutes happen. Shaitan will come, he will make you yawn, he will make you thirsty, he will make you sleepy, he will make you remember you had a meeting. All of that will happen in those 20 minutes. Why? Because you gave those 20 minutes to Qur'an. He hates that. He can't stand it. But make those 20 minutes happen. Commit to it. Commit to it with your children. Get the entire family, there's one part of the day, we're going to sit and we're going to recite Qur'an. Listen to the explanation, at least the translation of the Qur'an together as a family. If you can't do it for an hour, do 10 minutes. It's okay. Just listen to it. Just a little bit of 10 minutes of Qur'an. You're, I'm beyond the recitation. Recitation, I told you how many minutes? 20. 20 minutes. Listening to translation, some tafsir, some explanation, how long? 10 minutes. So how long you, every day? 30 minutes. You as a family just did something for Allah. 
my recommendation between Maghrib and Isha. And my recommendation, you know, right now you're gonna say, you know, kids have exams, it's May, let the semester end, fine. You know what, I'll give you that. This whole summer, this is what you do. 30 minutes every day. Don't say, which program should I put my child in? You're the program. You're the program. Everything else is secondary. We have to come to terms with that. Islam is not on autopilot. And I end with this, guys. Islam is not on autopilot. What do I mean by that? We were raised in a Muslim, many of, you, many of us, including myself, were raised in a Muslim country. Our parents didn't have to worry about our beliefs. They didn't, they didn't worry, is my child going to become a Christian? Is he going to become atheist? Is he going to become Jewish? They didn't have to worry about that. You know? They didn't have to worry, is my child going to go somewhere else and not pray Jumu'ah? They didn't have to worry about that. Then that thought never came in their mind. They don't have to worry that, you know, they didn't have to worry about you that you're going to end up in a gang or drugs or run away from home. They didn't have, they didn't have these issues. So Islam, they didn't have to worry about teaching you too much because the entire society in some way or another was teaching you. The school was teaching you, the, the adhan was being heard all over the neighborhood. Society was giving you Islam. Are we in that situation now? No. So you cannot raise your kids the way your parents raised you. Because you're not in the same world. Everything you assumed will just be okay. It'll be okay. We came out okay. You came out okay because you lived in a different world, buddy. This is a different world. We have no guarantee our children will be holding on to Islam. We don't have that guarantee. We don't. The pollution outside is not just of you know, car smog. The pollution outside is of kufr, is of raib. You know, taraddud, people are becoming doubtful. I cannot begin to tell you how many teenagers I've met who are not sure about Islam. They're just not sure. You know, and they hear so many bad things about the deen all the time. You know, we're in Texas after all. You know, they hear so many terrible things. To this morning, two Mormon teenage boys came to my house before Jumu'ah. Knocked on the door. Teenage boys, it's amazing, right? Teenage boys doing da'wah. I was like, man, if we had that, that'd be awesome. Which teenage boys you see get dressed up, they get dressed really nicely, like a uniform. They grab their bikes, it's 92 degrees outside, and they go house to house. We want to tell you about the Word of God. You know how much courage that takes? And before I start ripping their religion apart, I'm going to say, man, I appreciate what you guys are doing. That's amazing. They don't even have the truth. And they're so dedicated. And they were able to put that into their kids. Why? Because the Mormon community decided our children are our top priority. Forget everything else. We're not going to preach our religion. We're not going to teach it to anybody else. We don't have to build huge centers. All we have to worry about is our kids. That's it. We make sure they understand our religion. So they're teenage boys carrying this religion. You know? And I'm sitting and I'm talking to them. And you know, they believe this is the word of God. And it's a miracle. I was like, wow guys. It's not a miracle, but I really appreciate your dedication. I really, really appreciate your dedication. That's the kindest. I'm not saying we become Mormon or be like the Mormons. But I am saying, man, when you see something good, you should appreciate it. If they, they've got a good quality, it is to be appreciated. You know, we, we have something to learn from other communities. We do. And I tell you very quickly, the world is shifting. It's going to be people who believe in God on the one side and people who don't believe in any God on the other side. Right now we have disagreements among each other, different schools of thought, even Muslim versus Christian versus Jewish versus Hindu, etc, etc, etc. Pretty soon the world is polarizing along two lines. I don't believe in any God. In any religion I believe in a God. That's the shift that's happening. That's the, that's the polarization that's happening in every corner of the United States. And it's happening like wildfire. Don't you for a second think it's not going to affect the Muslim community? It is. It, it absolutely is. You and I have to learn Qur'an as parents. Not for our children, for ourselves. We have to learn Qur'an, we have to love it so much that our children as they're raised, they know my dad, somebody asked, what does your dad like to do? They say that he loves to learn the Qur'an. He's always talking about the Qur'an. I learned everything I know about the Qur'an, most of it I came from my dad. He's always listening to an explanation of it. He's always telling me to recite more. He's always memorizing it. He loves the recitation of it, all this stuff. We, are, we have to become a nation of Qur'an. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was surrounded by people who doubted. Just like we are surrounded by people who doubt. And the only thing that gave him belief was what? Qur'an, the word of Allah. It kept him strong. We have to become that nation again. 
us and our children. We have to become the 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 jail, the the jail, the, the generation of the Quran. It has to become central in our life. Thirty minutes a day, I'm start is a starting point. Thirty minutes a day, but for yourselves, the parents, get. I don't care if you're forty-five or fifty-five or sixty-five or seventy-five. Start memorizing Quran. Start doing it. Allah didn't put an age limit on it. Allah did not. That's you. Allah didn't do it. Show Allah you love His book. And Allah will put blessings in your life you didn't even see. You won't have to ask somebody else for advice on how to raise your children. Allah will give you that advice in His book. He will have those answers for you and me in His book. We have to have that direct relationship with this book. I tell you, most of our problems in the Muslim community are because we are disconnected from the Qur'an. We don't feel for it, we don't feel love for it, we don't have a relationship with it, we don't go to it for advice, we don't recite it every day, we don't care to memorize it, we don't care to learn more and more of it, we haven't shown it enough love. This word Allah gave, honored this ummah with, and we haven't given it enough love. If we did, I tell you, our problems would start disappearing. I guarantee you, you know? Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about the people of the book. He says, "Walau akamu Torah wa Injil, la akalu min fawqihim wa min tahti arjudihim." If they only established the Torah and the Injil, they would have eaten from above and below. Their dunya would have become Jannah. If they only established Torah and Injil, what is Allah saying to us then? If we only establish what? Quran. You will eat from above and below. Allah will make dunya into Jannah. Just come back to His book. This this is the real advice to parents. We leave our, the memory we leave our children with, my dad loved video games, my dad loved movies, but he, man, more than anything else, he loved Qur'an. He really liked basketball, but he loved Qur'an. Qur'an he really, really loved. And he made sure, he wanted us to love it too. He used to tell us stories from it. He used to give us advice from it. Tell your children the amazing stories from the Qur'an. And you won't be able to tell them if you yourself are not amazed by them. If you're, not, if you're not in awe of the story itself, you won't be able to impress your children. But man, from early childhood, you, you, not anybody else, you tell the stories from the Qur'an. You will have to do it. I, teach, I, I was teaching one of my daughters the story of Yusuf salam the other day. And I didn't finish the story. She's been asking me four days about what happened. Look, he got thrown into jail. Then what happened? I can't tell you. I'll tell you later. And she's been asking me, I'll tell her on the way back, I'll tell her today, inshallah. <laughs> What happened after he got thrown into jail? But we have to make and create an interest into our children. And the stories are so beautiful. They're so remarkable. Especially when you tell them from the Qur'an's point of view. They're so beautifully put together. May Allah Azza wa make us a people of Qur'an and instill that, give us the ability to instill that into our children. Have an honest, open, direct conversation with your children. Ask them about what, the, you know, what they heard in school, what problems they have. And then you yourself seek the answers from Allah, Allah's book. You say, you know the thing you just, your friend just told you? Or this terrible thing you saw? You know what Allah says about that? Let me show you. We're literally teaching our children how to go to Allah for answers. That's what we have to do. We have to create that generation. May Allah Azza wa help all of us do that. May Allah Azza wa put barakah in the lives of every Muslim. And may, Allah, and may Allah add barakah on top of barakah on top of barakah by means of our love and affection and time and dedication to this Qur'an. I wanted to take this opportunity, quite a few of you are here, to announce, make two quick announcements inshallah. Uh, the first of them is immediate and that's tomorrow. For our campus in Irving, we're having an open house. Uh, and we are inviting the community to come check out the Bayina campus and meet some of the students for this year. Many of you know, many of you don't know, we get about 60 students every year from all across America that study Arabic and Quran with us at the program. And we have a, a small like mini college type campus set up there. So we'd love for you to come and check it out and meet with the students. That's for tomorrow from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. That's all the way in Irving. I know that's a hijrah for you, but look, I made hijrah here so you can make hijrah there. That's fine, you know. Uh, that's, that's right across the Irving Masjid in Val, uh, 2300 Valley View Lane. I know you won't remember the address, just remember this email address, openhouse at bayina.com. Just remember that email address and we'll, give, we'll send you the information, okay? Openhouse at bayina.com. That's a small announcement. The big announcement, however, that I'm very excited to share with you, is that uh, Bayina is actually putting together its first conference. And um, I decided we had a lot of off offers. We had offers in LA and New York and other places to put the conference together there. But since this is home, I decided to do the conference here. So inshallah ta'ala on June the 30th is going to be the first Bayina conference, nationwide conference, but it's going to be held here in Dallas. It's at the Irving Convention Center. 
inshallah ta'ala. And that's once again June the 30th. Myself, Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda, and Imam Suhaib Webb from Boston is going to be there. So we're the three presenters. It's a one-day program. And I'd like you to sign up as soon as you can, yourself and your family. The, uh, the website address, if you can try to remember it, please, is amazedbythequran.com. Amazedbythequran.com. That's the name of the conference, Amazed by the Quran. All three of us are going to be presenting our favorite passages from the Quran from this year's studies. That's what we're all three of us are going to be doing, inshallah ta'ala. And there are other you know, kids' activities and other programs there too. So I hope all of you will join and help me spread the word in the area about the conference and help people sign up for that. Once again, let me see if you remember, what's the website address? Amazedbythequran.com Jazakumullah khair and so very much for listening attentively. If you folks have any questions, I don't know if we have time before salat. But if we do, I'll take them now, inshallah ta'ala.